En primer lugar, muchas gracias a First of all, thanks very much to everybody that's uh, joined our ecologic transition panel. It forms part of another uh, four at the conference, a project that started five years ago by the uh, Gibuthwa Provincial Council to uh, give a response uh, to the challenges of the future in the territory to uh, promote uh, collaborative governance. To open this uh, panel, we're going to hand over to Jose Ignacio Asensio, the uh, Regional Minister for the Environment and uh, Hydraulic Works. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone, once again. Just uh, uh, a few uh, words in Basque. I'm going to be speaking Spanish most of the time, but you know that we have uh, translation into Spanish uh, and English. But uh, first of all, I would like to welcome our advisory committee and scientific committee. I think that uh, it's the uh, most important thing we have regarding uh, knowledge, background, and wisdom in this area. We want to share our experiences with you. And uh, as we said uh, during the opening, Share, change whatever needs to be changed, and uh, listen carefully uh, to you uh, tomorrow after uh, the presentation today. The advisory committee is made up of Ismael Arnar, Jesus Martinez Linares, Joaquin Nieto, Jesus Alquizar, and Fernando Valladares, that are known to all of you. And as you'll understand, this is uh, the uh, panel. And uh, the fact uh, uh, they are of. Uh, a top level. And uh, I would like to uh, start by thanking you for participating in this uh, panel on uh, ecological transition. And as we saw on the video, I can take this off, can't I? Uh, otherwise, it's uh, hard going for the voice. The fact is that in four and a half minutes, uh, we've uh, run through what uh, we uh, proposed doing uh, barely uh, six years ago. We had uh, a major problem in uh, Gipuzkoan uh, society that many of you uh, here know about, but others don't. And uh, to solve uh, that uh, problem, we tried to carry out a transformation in the environmental management of the territory, and especially by the provincial council. But I'm not going to dwell on that, because probably during the discussion, uh, some items will come up, and I don't want to speak too long. After me, we will have Monica Pedriga, the uh, director for the environment, who's also very well uh, known uh, to you, and Rafaela Romero, who will talk about uh, mobility uh, with uh, the magnificent work that's being done in relation to tariffs and social policies, Isaac Palencia who is one of the uh, promoters of the uh, think tank of uh, youth uh, against climate change. And then Monica and I will uh, finish up with uh, a few uh, comments on the future and uh, the challenges. And uh, I uh, mentioned uh, you, but today we're going to be uh, given an examination. We'll try to give a fairly agile uh, presentation. I'm just going to talk about the contextualization and uh, the uh, challenges uh, we're facing. And Monica will uh, go into uh, more detail. We started to uh, carry out a transformation of the Provincial Council policies with new approaches in 2016, 2017. And the years are important. And that's why we showed them here, because we did have uh, an approach uh, which was uh, stopping producing a greenhouse uh, gas uh, by 2050. We wanted an economic growth that was uh, decoupled from resources and uh, no people or places left behind. This is what inspired us uh, in the regulations that we uh, inspired in a strategy in the fight against climate change, Gipuzkoa Climate 2050, and also uh, waste management regulations, obviously inspired on what was being done in Europe, where there were already documents, drafts uh, before uh, the uh, pan-European pact. 
But before that, uh, we all already had regulations that uh, fitted fairly well with what later on became the Green Deal and the Next Generation Recovery Plan, etc. And these are the messages I wanted to put across, but it's also something that uh, we want to assess together with you. We want you to be critical and uh, say, uh, uh, this is missing, that is missing, or you haven't gotten into these areas in sufficient uh, depth. It's also true that the uh, latest IPPC uh, reports uh, uh, are not uh, very positive either. They put us uh, uh, before the uncertainty of not doing enough of not uh, speeding up changes uh, firmly enough. And uh, this also uh, means that we have to make new decisions and change the pace of our transformations. And it's also true that um, with the uh, latest implementation and uh, the development of the Green Deal policies, uh, the European policies, and uh, their transfer through the next generation funds uh, to through policies like uh, Spain Can or Euskadi Next, or also all the projects we've uh, launched uh, at the Provincial Council. And at the end of the presentation, we'll um, give uh, some uh, details on some of them. And talking about the new economic paradigm, obviously we're not referring just to the traditional uh, relations. When we talk about a paradigm shift, we, that means we have to look at things differently. The fact that we've uh, discussed waste management so much means that we uh, started with a situation where the environment uh, practically only covered the basics. And uh, what we've done is uh, to promote uh, everything that uh, refers to that ecological transition, that transformation of those problems that need to be resolved and uh, that need to be turned into opportunities. And how would we do that? through two very basic concepts, uh, first of all, uh, including citizens, uh, aware citizens. And when we talk about waste management, uh, as we will uh, do in the fight against climate change, we have a society in Gipuzkoa that's uh, very sensitive to the issue. And uh, Monica will uh, go into further details. But I would like to mention that we have a selective waste uh, collection at the point of origin which uh, exceeds 58% uh, of the waste, 20% uh, uh, higher than the Spanish average. And uh, the uh, second uh, point I wanted to bring up is that we have provided the necessary infrastructures for this uh, good job done by citizens uh, to lead to the recovery of materials to um, produce uh, secondary raw materials to uh, promote uh, a circular economy uh, but uh, for real, going from uh, words to deeds, because we recover over 200,000 tons of material. And obviously, we have to take the steps so that the industry in Gipuzkoa will uh, make full use of uh, this material. The policies uh, promoted by all the regulations and the uh, practice uh, we followed in the last few years uh, contain uh, seven fundamental axes. It's not exactly uh, what's uh, shown in the Green Deal, but uh, all uh, seven uh, certainly fit in. There may be some missing or some uh, may need changing, but this is a subject for discussion that will certainly enrich uh, this panel. I'll just mention them. I'm not going to dwell on them very much because you all know them, but seven transformation uh, policies um, that uh, come from uh, our regulations and strategies uh, from uh, the year 2017. And I mention uh, the years because this is before the approval of certain uh, European and uh, national regulations. And what I mean to say is that we've already started on the path and what we have to do is uh, speed up. So these uh, policies are energy transition. The drive of renewable energies in the territory is fundamental. We have uh, uh, dependence on energy consumption and production uh, from uh, outside uh, the region that is more than 90 percent. So a lot uh, has to be done. But again, we'll do it together with our citizens. One of the main factors in uh, transformation and development is going to be self-consumption and uh, distributed generation uh, through uh, energy communities, and we'll look at this later on. 
sustainable and healthy food. The second axis, which has become increasingly important uh, in Europe uh, from farm to fork, policies uh, that uh, we are working by working with the uh, hospitality industry, sustainable mobility that will be explained by Gabriela Romero. And uh, so I'm not going to dwell on this too much. Uh, the circular economy, as I mentioned, uh, as well as waste management, um, obviously everything that has to do with eco design and product uh, life cycle and uh, what has to do with the development of European projects. And later on, we'll mention several of the projects, uh, including green uh, hydrogen, decarbonization of the economy, etc. The fifth uh, axis, green, digital, competitive and resilient industry, the decarbonization of various uh, sectors in the economy. And here again, we'll work uh, in depth to develop uh, some of the specific uh, aspects uh, we've been working on. Jobs in the future and uh, the effect this has on young people and uh, new generations and what is going to mean as a transformation, especially in a territory like this where more than 30 percent of the GDP is industrial. We want uh, to continue to uh, have uh, that uh, industrial uh, weight in GDP, which uh, provides uh, decent jobs and salaries, and we have to preserve that above all. But here we have an important uh, job to do. We have to work on talent and develop it uh, with the technology centers and universities in the territory, etc., etc. And of course, biodiversity and all the green infrastructure plans that we're also developing in the territory and that will be uh, presented here. And I'm going to leave it here. I'm not going to uh, go into uh, further details. I don't know uh, how deep we'll be able to go into each subject, but non Monica, I'm going to hand over uh, to you so you can go into the details on these aspects. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you very much, Jose Ignacio. From the DG for the Environment, and in line with the proposals of the Green Deal and the various uh, strategies that, that are being approved by the European Union, during uh, these years we've been redesigning and restructuring the programs that already existed and uh, created new programs uh, to face a reality that we are all aware of the climate emergency and the fight against climate change. But uh, first, uh, let me start uh, by uh, repeating something I heard very recently. I heard it from somebody from our advisory uh, board, and I think it's important to consider it. Climate change is a problem that we have created, human beings, uh, because of the crisis in biodiversity. We have to understand that taking on the policies of fight against climate change uh, mean that we need to understand and uh, correct the role we all play in biodiversity because uh, well-being and health depend on this as shown on the slide. Many of the consequences we're suffering today, including pandemics, uh, are caused by that biodiversity crisis, that breakdown in our ecosystemic systems that are leading us to this uh, climate emergency uh, we're facing. And how are we working on it uh, from the DG for the Environment? Well, th through these uh, or through five of those seven policies uh, that the Regional Minister for the Environment mentioned, I'm going to try to summarize. I'm going to try to go quickly. And during tomorrow's session, we'll be able to uh, cover any queries. First of all, the energy transition. To work on the energy transition, we first need to understand what the role of the Provincial Council is. Our role is a territorial role. As you know, the design of the energy uh, policies, uh, the major wind parks, the major infrastructures, uh, the renewable energy come under the uh, BAS government, the EV, and the Provincial Council uh, works with the territorial value of uh, bringing that energy transition, as the regional minister said, to our citizens, uh, to our SMEs, to small businesses. And this is why we initiated the transformation of our energy system in 2019. And we started off with the first thing that we believe was fundamental, in other words, having a legal framework that would allow us to carry out this transformation. 
this year, or this month in particular, we will at long last approve the Gipuzkoa strategy, the sustainability strategy we have for the year 2050. A strategy that has eight basic principles and which have served as an inspiration and uh, which I would like to underscore three. Firstly, it's a strategy of uh, an energy transition that is based on the fact that energy is a basic uh, element. It has to be accessible to all of our citizens and is a basic thing. A strategy that is based on distributed generation, but above all on producing renewables, proximity renewables. So um, promoting self-consumption, which at the end of the day is what is going to allow us not only to decarbonize our economic activities and also improve the competitiveness of our industries, but it's also going to allow us uh, to uh, make uh, energy more democratic and which is uh, all about uh, bringing this uh, energy closer to our citizens so that they can have these economic savings. But why did we decide to carry out an energy transition in the territory? Because I think that everybody knows that Spain, generally speaking, in the case of the EU countries, we are the uh, country with the fifth most expensive energy prices and the third in terms of gas. And uh, if we go to Gipuzkoa, in Gipuzkoa, 25.5% of our population is facing a risk of energy vulnerability. That is 63,500 dwellings. And especially for our committee, well, you, we have a population of 741,000 inhabitants. We have an energy sector in which uh, the consumption of renewables relative to the total consumption only accounts for 18%. And of this 18%, only 7% is produced in Gipuzkoa. So in other words, we have an energy dependence uh, that is 93%. An energy dependence that affects us, that affects the institutions, that affects our citizens, but also has a very direct impact. And considering the economic situation we've seen in recent months, affects the competitiveness of our SMEs. So we now have a fossil system in which 55% uh, is uh, based on oil and 18% uh, on gas. So. Bearing in mind this uh, picture throughout the strategy, it's a strategy that obviously has uh, developed different di types of actions. And what we've done is establish what we call the hierarchy of our energy pyramid. In other words, how we have to work to diminish that energy dependence and promote responsible consumption. And what is the base of our strategy? First, savings. We need to save energy because we still have unnecessary consumptions. And firstly, we have to optimize uh, energy consumption. And secondly, we have energy efficiency. Energy efficiency that we are currently working on in our buildings, in our facilities, in our machinery, in our industries, in our shops, and also at home. How? We do so through in-smart monitoring systems, but we also do so by um, explaining to citizens how they can improve uh, energy efficiency at home by providing training and workshops that we are giving throughout the territory. Thirdly, generating renewables. As I said, we only have 7% of renewables. Gibuthwa, due to its size, it's a place with lots of hills and lots of valleys. And it's uh, limited, it has uh, limited possibilities as regards setting up major renewable infrastructures. So this is why the sustainability strategy for Gipuzkoa is focused on a decentralized model, on a model that uh, what it wants to do is uh, make use of uh, what we already have, the roofs and small lots to generate uh, mobility energy. So in other words, we have to move on to a decentralized system. So instead of an oligopoly, it has to be a participative system. Instead of fossils, it has to be renewables. So it has, uh, instead of uh, contaminating, we have to deliver a clean solution or a clean system. And how are we doing that? Well, firstly, we're doing this through two uh, tools, through the communities and through the energy cooperatives. Why two tools? Because, as I said, Gipuzkoa is diverse, and it's also diverse as regards its municipalities. 
It's 88 municipalities, of which only two have more than 50,000 inhabitants. We have 31 municipalities that have between 5 and 50,000 inhabitants and 54 that have less than 5,000. And these are municipalities that are called the democratic challenge and with which we have to work. And what we have to do is design solutions adapted to what our territory needs, which are different as a function of uh, the typology of the municipality. So we have to change the model, and we believe that the benefits we're going to obtain are very clear. Apart from increasing the production of renewables and having decentralized energy, we're going to achieve economic savings for our citizens and for our SMEs, as we are already seeing. And I'll talk about this in some of the communities we have up and running. And above all, the citizens are going to play an active role in this new energy transition uh, scheme. When we talk about energy transition, fair energy transition, it's because we understand that citizens, and this is what the Gipuzkoa strategy defends, the citizens play an active role. Because this is going to allow us to reduce uh, the figure that I mentioned at the beginning, this energy vulnerability in these 63,500 dwellings. And right now on the territory, we have four energy communities up and running for communities that have been implemented after two years of work and which have something in common. All of them are located in municipal um, roofs that are provided by town councils. And this is important because what is being created is a collaborative system, not only from the provincial council, but also with the rest of the stakeholders, with the town councils which at the end of the day are the administration that is closest to our citizens and closest to the shops or the retail businesses. So these are systems that are based on promoting self-consumption to generate this proximity power. And you know that we have a limitation that has been established by the decree, and that is that all those users that participate in these energy communities have to be within a radius of 500 uh, meters and we want to obtain the lowest possible prices and then there's a joint procurement of the power and uh, participation in these energy communities they are open and flexible in other words there are no barriers as regards uh, the entrance or departure of citizens and we believe that this has to be so because when in the public authorities when we support any model or any change in any energy systems citizens first of all should have the possibility of uh, coming and going and secondly there has to be transparency in terms of data and pricing and uh, participation in these uh, energy communities that are subsidized uh, by the provincial council represents um, something for any citizen that wants to participate, something like 50 to 80 euros a year. And according to the figures we have on one of the first energy communities, which is Thumaraga, the annual savings that citizens will obtain for participating are range between 200 and 250 euros. So you can see that this is not a barrier. So any citizens, and especially those that are much more vulnerable, they can all benefit from these systems. So there are four energy communities in operation, one in Thumaraga, where we have installed 160 kilovolts and where we have 290 citizens involved at Berobi, another small municipality with a demographic challenge where we've installed 40 uh, kilowatts uh, and we have 70 citizens. La Rao, another municipality with a demographic challenge where we've installed 30 kilowatts and we have more than 50 uh, citizens and shops and Odessa, where we have 121 kilowatts and where we have 55 citizens enrolled. And then in the case of the smallest municipalities with a demographic challenge, well, these are obviously our municipalities that in many cases don't even have technical or legal services that will allow them to carry out this transition. And we thought that it was important uh, from the point of view of the provincial council, because we are a territorial agent, we had to support them not only in the early stages, but also throughout the entire technical and legal development of the participation process. And uh, we had to provide them with as much information as possible. And we've just uh, built a European project that we've uh, submitted to the resilience mechanism. And we have presented 
24 energy communities that would be added on to the four that are already in existence. 24 energy communities in 21 municipalities with 48 public roofs and with a capex from the provincial council of 3.1 million euros which means that we're going to have an additional installed power of uh, 1,079 kilowatts. But we also have to uh, do something about the bigger municipalities because there are places like San Sebastian or Iron. And even if we were to have all the public roofs uh, available, we wouldn't have enough to deliver service to citizens that also want to carry out the transition. And there's this other model that coexists with the previous one that has to do with the energy cooperatives, the Ikiola model. And as mentioned before, they haven't yet been built, but four energy cooperatives are being launched in Gipuzkoa, in San Sebastian, Azpeitia, Zumaya, and Arrasate. And compared to the previous model in which the energy communities were located on rooftops, now, these are facilities that go on the ground, and for that, you need to occupy one hectare. And uh, these occupations, to the largest possible extent, should um, occupy degraded soil or neglected soil. And this means that uh, there can be a larger number of participants. And, well, for instance, in a um, surface of one hectare, you could install a solar park of about two megawatts and uh, we could, um, I don't know, register 500 cooperativists. But compared to the previous model where there's a fee for entry, this is based on a non-speculative model. In other words, each member of the cooperative can only acquire the panels they require for consumption because we don't want these to be speculative models. And uh, what we ask them is that they make an initial contribution which ranges between 2,500 and 3,500 euros, which is another of the models that is being developed. And the second of these policies, and I'm going to go through this quickly because I'm running out of time, and the second of these policies that Jose Ignacio has just explained and that we've been working on at the Department for Environmental Affairs has to do with the farm to form strategy. As you know, this has a very clear objective. Firstly, guaranteeing enough food that is affordable and nutritional and re the reduce reduction of uh, fertilizer and uh, pesticides, increasing the consumption of more sustainable food and avoiding food fraud, improving um, animal well-being. And I'm going to dwell on this last point, which is all about reducing food waste. And this is where at the Department for Environmental Affairs, we are trying to contribute towards this uh, European strategy. But why are we trying to do this? Well, I said this at the beginning because of the um, farm to fork table coincides with the biodiversity strategy. And this is covered by the Green Agreement. So developing more sustainable uh, food systems that are more respectful with the environment means that we have to protect biodiversity and it also means that we have to reduce greenhouse gases and therefore have to fight against climate change. But in order to understand what uh, food waste means in global terms, nearly one-fifth of the food of the world ends up in the dustbin. And it, according to Antonio Guterres, who is the Secretary General of the United Nations, we have enough food to feed everybody, that, uh, even though 820 million people are um, hungry. One out of every five children have growth problems and are lacking food. But this might seem like a big figure, and it might seem that it, as it's an international figure and it doesn't happen in Europe, we've uh, focused on Gipuzkoa. And in our diagnosis, we have seen that in Gipuzkoa, our citizens throw away 165 kilos of food um, every year. So how are we trying to reduce uh, food, food waste? Well, through three initiatives. And the first one that we've been working on with the Oreca sector, that is with the hospitality business, that accounts for 23% of uh, the generation of food waste we have in Gipuzkoa. And over the last uh, three years, and thanks to the collaboration of the Association of the Hospitality Business, we've developed what we call the Gourmet Ba campaign. And what it does is that uh, this food, when you go to a restaurant and there's something that you don't eat, 
And if you leave it there, it uh, becomes food waste. Well, it should no longer be that because by asking the gourmet bag, you can take it to your home and it's no longer waste because it's a resource that you can consume. Well, we've uh, handed out more than 12,000 containers. We have 11 municipalities out of the 88 of the province that have already joined this campaign. In San Sebastian, Irun, Eibar, Arrasate, Biasain, Zarauz, 63 bars and restaurants are already collaborating with this uh, campaign called Gourmet Bag, Gourmet Bag, that we want to uh, boost over the next few years to make sure that it reaches out to Gipuzkoa. The second tool we're trying to reduce food waste with has to do with collaborating with the food bank through the last minute program. This food program is now helping more than 20,000 people in Gipuzkoa. But of this figure that I've given you, it's 25% more of people that are being helped after COVID, which goes to show that there were households that have been affected to a greater extent. But thanks to the last minute program and thanks to the collaboration with the supermarket networks and also with the markets and with the hospitality business and even with the catering companies that are operating at schools where we managed to recover those helpings that are not served, we have managed to avoid 1,000 tons in waste, in food waste. And this uh, is food <coughs> that can be um, consumed thanks to these programs. And the third line of action we have to fight against food waste has to do with innovation. Innovation is going to be a key element in the transformation of our food system. And in this regard, in Gipuzkoa, we're very lucky because we have a reference, which is the Basque Culinary Center, sorry, which is a gastronomy university, a leader and the Hari Redman organization have been, been working with them to find uh, technological solutions. We've been looking for new gastronomical solutions that do not only uh, promote uh, this uh, concept and also uh, promote uh, sustainable farming, but we want to reduce food waste by looking for new recipes and uh, new kinds of food. So to date, uh, things that uh, could be uh, reutilized. The third lever has to do with the circular economy. Perhaps this is one of the most important policies because when we're saying that we have to transform the economic system and that we have to put our stakes on a sustainable economic growth strategy, what we're saying is that we have to transform absolutely everything, that is resources, materials, uh, energy, our industry. So this is why it's uh, one of the policies that was one of the first that was to be implemented by the DG for Environmental Affairs in 2016. And we want a youth world that is 100% circular by 2050. But doing so, as from 2050, well, this means that what we have to do is implement a PPP because the challenge is so significant that when none of us is going to do this in an isolated manner. So this is why we're working according to a PPP model. And we are involving our citizens, our universities, technology centers and the industry at large, each one according to their role. We believe that the role to be played by the public administration has to do with providing economic resources to build the necessary infrastructures so that this waste can become a resource. With our citizens deeply committed as we have in Gipuzkoa and which has allowed us to become a reference and to play an outstanding role as regards selective uh, waste collection and also with universities and technology centers in our industry, we have to establish synergies so that we can um, carry out a transformation of these resources so that they could be transformed into new raw materials through reutilization, recycling, and recovery systems. As I said before, Gipuzkoa is a territory and where the rate of recycling, of reutilization of waste uh, stands at 34.7 in 2019. In 2020, our rate of recycling was the highest in Spain, and we have a rate of 55.24%. So that means to say that in Gipuzkoa, five years before the objective that is going to be established by the future law, by 2025, it's something that we will be fulfilling. And we have done so because we've been working intensely, first on what I said before, and on having infrastructures like um, packaging facilities, 
where our efforts are collectively um, recycling these uh, containers and we also have an infrastructure so that all of this plastic and all of these uh, pecs that we uh, generate in our daily lives and that are generated by uh, industries can be recycled by transforming organic waste that we collect in a differential manner and through compost and uh, through the composting and biomethanization plants that we'll see that the biomethanization plant, which is uh, something for the future and that will be explained by the deputy at the end of this uh, panel. And then we have the environmental complex of Gipuzkoa, where the fractions go through a mechanical and biological processing plant, and this allows us to recover another 10% of those materials that can still be recycled and where the rest, uh, the waste is uh, made use of for, for the production of energy. And as you know, this plant, and this was defined by the Paris Accord, 50% has to be renewables, but we are producing electricity at about 40, for, for about 45,000 households. This is the snapshot of Gibuthkwa in terms of waste, and a snapshot where you can see that we do meet the objectives for glass by 2025 and for paper and cardboard. We are two points away from this with containers, 0.50 from reaching bio-waste, and the rate on the whole is 55.24%. But we also have to bear in mind that apart from this municipal waste that we are managing, the urban waste, we also have other waste, which is industrial waste. Industries that have to be supported in this transition, they have to carry out. And in this regard, in 2016, when we launched the first uh, circular economy action plan for Gipuzkoa, we set up a tool which is Heka GK Recycling, and it's supposed to be a cluster that uh, boosts this PPP, a collaboration between different industries because the waste of one is the resource of another. Or this can also generate uh, synergies to implement new technological developments like a bioeconomy and uh, new um, recovery processes. Although today they haven't been fully developed, we do have to speed them up. But the GK recycling cluster that was established in the years 2015 and 16 with eight companies is now represented by 81 companies in Gipuzkoa that are working in the field of a circular economy. Of these 81 companies, 48 are industries, 12 are technology centers and universities, seven are um, non-for-profit organizations and associations where we include all the associations have to do with solidarity economy, which play a transcendental role in circular economy as regards a reutilization, and 15 consultants and environmental engineering firms. And this cluster now accounts for 6% of our GDP and of our jobs. So what is the snapshot like? How are we going to work to carry out this transition in our companies? Last year, well, this year basically, in other words, well, last year, in 2020, we've been developing our own tool that we've tested uh, at all the companies that form part of the cluster and of circular economy. And we've uh, looked into how our companies stand in terms of circular economy and the use of uh, materials, waste, and energy, as well as in terms of sustainability. That is economic uh, sustainability, costs, and sustainability seen in terms of employment policies and equality policies and how this cluster is uh, allowing us to achieve the sustainable development goals or objectives. Well, as you can see in, on, in this picture on the screen in Gibothkwa right now, uh, circular economy accounts for 5,700 people that are working in this area. And it also means that this cluster manages something like 1 million tons per year of urban waste and industrial waste. And it's true that we still have a way to go because we still have 37% of waste, fundamentally industrial waste, that end up at landfills. But thanks to this analysis that we are now finalizing and that will be presented in January next year, we will be able to um, design the roadmap that our companies need to give them support and tell them where they have to innovate and tell them how they should work on ecosystem or eco design and uh, carry out an in depth analysis of where the efforts have to be made and where public resources have to be invested for this 37% uh, of the year 2021 will allow us to reach uh, the figure of 0% in order to achieve our fully circular Gibuthkwa. 
And the fourth lever we're working on has to do with decarbonizing our industry. I think that everybody is aware of the fact that we have to achieve climate neutrality, and that means that you have to decarbonize the industry. But this also has to be an opportunity, and we have to improve the competitiveness of our companies and of our economic sector. And in order to do so, this is the new program we've launched that we are designing this year, and it's going to be launched in January next year. But the aim is to design together with our industries. We want to design a roadmap that uh, will speed up mm, the decarbonization process we are currently involved in. But we want to do so from a twofold perspective, from the economic perspective, because when we say that the ecological transition offers an opportunity, we really have to be able to design this decarbonization so that it will produce a competitive advantage for our company, so that it will improve their resilience in the short, medium, and long term, so that we can generate more jobs, new jobs that are going to be generated um, thanks uh, to the R&D plus side that we have to develop because all of these solutions are not in writing. And what we have to do is we have to work, we have to learn more about these sectors so that we can design and develop this response. This uh, road back on the decarbonization of economy is being done hand in hand with one of the leading technology centers of Euskadi that's called Technalia and IK. How are we going to do this? How are we going to implement this roadmap to decarbonize our economy? We've um, set a, a time horizon of three years, a time horizon where in 2022 we'll be moving into stage one. And firstly, what we are going to do is uh, make a specific uh, diagnosis of greenhouse gases in our industrial sectors because we cannot uh, plan anything or we cannot implement anything unless we have first-hand information on how each one of our sectors is. And if we don't prioritize those sectors in which we should do, do something uh, first. So once we've identified these sectors and after performing this analysis in 2022, it, then in 2023, we want to launch the first pilot projects with the assistance of our technology centers and universities and certain industries so that we can then uh, develop these experiences and carry out the decarbonization of economy, fundamentally in terms of energy transition and also in terms of using resources efficiently, but also to reduce greenhouse gases and uh, to develop a new um, carbon capture technologies. And then stage three, which we hope we'll be able to carry out in 2024, and uh, once uh, these pilot projects have been carried out and once they've been tested in these industrial sectors, we have to replicate things and have to adapt them to the rest of these sectors uh, we would like to work with. And the final uh, policy, but for me, it's one of the most important elements and which we've uh, started to work on. Well, we've been working for years on recovering degraded areas. But it is true that uh, we've made a very intense effort with the new program that has to do with the green infrastructures. As I said before, climate change is a consequence of the biodiversity crisis. But when we talk about biodiversity, we're talking about um, not only nature, we're talking not only about uh, sheltered or protected spaces, we're talking about well-being and health. We're talking about environmental benefits and uh, talking about biodiversity or the conservation of biodiversity. And this does not only allow us to eliminate uh, water pollution or soil pollution, but it also produces social uh, benefits. And we have to start to understand and uh, we have to be able to reflect the importance that this has uh, from a transversal perspective in each and every one of the policies we've implemented at the Provincial Council. Social benefits, because uh, together with biodiversity conservation, there's an improvement of the health and well-being of our citizens. Because when we talk about uh, green infrastructures and when we talk about uh, the conservation of biodiversity, we're also talking about creating new jobs that are related to this new line of work. We're talking about diversifying local economies, and we're talking about um, living and providing our citizens with uh, cities and spaces that are much more attractive that are greener and uh, healthier. But as I said before, we have to fight against climate change because if somebody is uh, the regulatory engine for all of these uh, greenhouse gas effects, it is biodiversity through our nature and through our oceans. 
with the effect they have as CO2 sumps. And uh, how have we done this? Well, we've done so firstly by evaluating or by drafting the first diagnosis of the green infrastructures of Gipuzkoa. And it's a diagnosis that goes far beyond of the Natura 2000 network and uh, the sheltered spaces. We wanted to have a diagnosis that would allow us to establish uh, the criteria we're going to be sticking to in Gipuzkoa to understand what it is we're going to rate as a green infrastructure or what not. And secondly, so that we can also implement an action plan to see how we can improve all these areas. As you can see, what we want to do was create a map of ecological functionality. We use the multi-criteria analysis fundamentally defining in the first place the important ecological spaces of the territory as well as the spaces of natural interest. And by well, by doing carrying out an in-depth analysis of our ecosystems, and also analysing things at a local and regional scale, we wanted to look into the elements of fragmentation we had in the territory. And with all of that, what we have right now is an area of uh, ecological functionality in Gipuzkoa that has established that uh, we have to work in the first uh, action plan. It's the plan for 2022 to 2026 in an environment of uh, 551,000 square kilometers, which is uh, something like 25 percent of our territory. Un plan de infraestructuras verdes en el que queremos trabajar en... A green infrastructure plan how, where we want to work on all kinds of landscapes, urban landscapes, uh, rural landscapes, uh, coastal uh, landscapes. And these are the five uh, lever policies we're working on at the Department for the Environment. And I'm going to hand over now to the regional uh, minister uh, for mobility, Rafael uh, Romero, who can explain how we work on the sixth policy to uh, develop a sustainable mobility model. Thank you. Egunon guztioi, e ore handia da niretza. Good morning, everyone. It's a great uh, honor to work in the area of mobility in the Gipuzkoa Provincial Council. Participating uh, in this uh, conference, um, especially in this uh, ecological transition panel, is uh, an honor being able to speak together with my colleague Jose Ignacio Asensio. And I say it's an honor, not uh, as just an expression, but because I feel uh, very proud of Gipuzkoa and uh, its people, of uh, being their representative. Since uh, people are the reason for our mobility, each society has its own uh, characteristics uh, in each uh, region. And this uh, also uh, can be felt uh, nationwide and uh, internationally. After all, they are the protagonists of our system. In our democratic system, Mobility is one of the uh, criterion that uh, is important to her. Mobility should be green and ecological. This is what we need. But we also need uh, equality and social inclusion. And uh, for this reason, sustainable mobility in Gipuzkoa ought to be uh, the goal for our work. People should have the uh, possibility of uh, enjoying uh, their rights, and this is something we should provide through our work. Experts and leaders uh, in Europe 
tell us uh, that we're meeting the necessary standards. Um, and in the uh, Gipuzkoa Mobility Department, uh, when we talk about mobility, we're talking about something that uh, goes beyond uh, going from here to there. It's also a matter of rights because it's a fundamental right uh, for people and for collectives. And uh, it's a service that should be provided uh, with quality services under the parameters of equality, accessibility, and sustainability, a basic right that is guaranteed as a citizen's right uh, in order to be able to uh, travel all over the territory of uh, Gipuzkoa and uh, the adjoining provinces of Alba, Bizkaia, and we hope soon uh, that it will uh, go as far as uh, Pamplona. So although uh, mobility and public transport are different concepts, uh, they are irrevocably linked uh, to guarantee that right to mobility. Because what do we talk about when we talk about uh, social uh, sustainability? What are we talking about when we say that uh, the transition should be ecological and also just? Social uh, sustainability defines those states and territories, those peoples, those uh, societies that have uh, the goal of creating a more prosperous and equitable society in uh, the most uh, suitable situation for everyone and not for just a few. And that's why uh, the uh, public administrations and the uh, governments should undertake to make sure that the necessary ecological uh, transition as well as being environmentally sustainable should uh, be socially just. And uh, among the various uh, frameworks that we need to uh, consider that uh, design uh, the paths we should take include uh, the uh, 17 uh, SDGs uh, that also lead to social sustainability in areas such as uh, mobility. And uh, except for uh, SDG 17 regarding alliances, the public uh, services and communication sectors have an essential participation. And uh, this means that there is a direct uh, relationship uh, between providing public services uh, and the targets we set ourselves uh, to comply with the 2030 agenda in our territory. And I would also say that good public services like transport are catalysts to reduce uh, poverty, SDG 1, create more equality, SDG 10, and favor uh, fewer conflicts, uh, SDG 16. And therefore, uh, we uh, have to be firm in uh, sharing with you that uh, for a just uh, development, uh, public services, uh, their companies and their staff uh, are silent uh, allies, but essential allies uh, to build a more equitable, peaceful, inclusive, and competitive society. And that's why guaranteeing a social sustainability uh, by ensuring public services, um, as occurs in uh, Gipuzkoa with the public transport systems, means uh, taking on a uh, commitment uh, in all uh, dimensions, such as sustainability, the economic, uh, social sustainability, environmental sustainability. And uh, since we're at this conference today, it's also related to good governance. Or, in other words, uh, economic growth uh, should include social inclusion and uh, economic progress uh, should be accompanied uh, by fighting the environmental deterioration. And uh, only this uh, will make it possible to really say that the development of a territory is really sustainable and that the ecological transition is uh, just uh, for everyone. And we must also uh, highlight in the area of uh, mobility that in order to achieve uh, sustainability, uh, uh, public management uh, putting on its stakes on the implementation of innovative technologies is vital, as well as uh, digitization and the uh, transformation of mobile support. Because only in this way, as we've done with the ticketing system with uh, the uh, Gipuzkoa transport system, will we uh, make a smart, inclusive, and uh, resilient uh, society. These instruments uh, guaranteed public services and new uh, technologies and digitization are 
especially in the area of mobility, the essential tools are for territories like ours to uh, develop uh, on a homogeneous basis, uh, guaranteeing territorial cohesion and social cohesion, and both uh, tools uh, to provide uh, accessibility that is as universal as possible, guaranteeing non-discrimination. And uh, when we talk about uh, social sustainability, I hope uh, that uh, it will be understood that we're talking about social rights, fundamental rights, human rights uh, to guarantee uh, uh, living conditions for all society, especially uh, for the people that are discriminate, discriminated against, uh, marginalized, uh, or outside the traditional economic framework. Um, the aim is to provide a decent uh, living to everyone, offering the uh, essential of public services, uh, which, like public transport, uh, guarantee the right to mobility. And how do we work on that social sustainability in uh, Gipuzkoa through mobility? Well, uh, starting with a clear message, it is essential to uh, guarantee uh, a democratic right to mobility, equal uh, opportunities and access uh, to goods and services, uh, food, health, education, uh, safety, uh, work, uh, culture, and leisure, so that uh, everyone can uh, travel regardless of where we live, and especially regardless of the resources uh, that are available to us. And this uh, means providing a transport system to uh, provide opportunities and uh, resources uh, for citizens. Uh, if uh, there isn't uh, an integrated uh, quality transport system, homes that don't have sufficient income uh, to be able to afford a private transport uh, will find it uh, very uh, difficult uh, to share equal opportunities. Therefore, the public uh, transport services are essential to make sure that we all have equal opportunities uh, to be able to travel and at the same time to uh, make sure that we favor an accessible and sustainable uh, mobility model. And this is the case of Gipuzkoa. In Gipuzkoa, we continue to work uh, to ensure citizens' rights through a public system that will guarantee that equality. And we're moving forward in a sustainable model in the three uh, dimensions I mentioned. And in order to achieve uh, this, we started a plan on March 4th, 2013, when all public transport operators uh, joined a single planning and coordinating body, uh, the Buthkwa uh, Transport uh, Authority a landmark that made it possible to start up uh, the uh, tariff integration policy and uh, the MOBI card, the uh, Gipuzkoa uh, mobility card. And uh, today uh, uh, obtains a high score in mobility because of uh, the uh, people that backed the single tariff system, since we're the only uh, territory that uh, has interoperability between all the transport agents in the public sector, including road transport and railway transport, uh, and uh, with a single price system. Or in other words, we are the only territory that has a single ticket for all means of public transport, a single ticket uh, that is materialized through the Mugi card, but which goes further than a uh, mere uh, debit card, because the uh, Mugi card is a citizen's rights card that guarantees that people can travel on all modes of transport, uh, as I mentioned earlier, regardless of uh, whether it's by road or railway, on urban or interurban systems, and uh, it's done uh, with uh, the uh, same uh, price system. To provide a capillary system that reaches uh, the whole uh, territory, uh, regardless of uh, where uh, people live. And uh, for this purpose, we have the uh, Lural de Bus uh, company, uh, the uh, road transport company, that uh, provides uh, interurban transport uh, covering the whole territory and uh, reaching uh, practically 80% of the population. The uh, road uh, system uh, has over uh, 
200,000 trips per day, according to the latest uh, data from 2019. After that, we've had the pandemic, and now we're back to uh, 80% of that level. And uh, this uh, recovery is hopeful. And that's why I say that Mugi uh, guarantees the social right to mobility under conditions uh, that uh, cannot be uh, covered unless you have a system that uh, provides uh, coverage, intermodality, and ticket price integration. The uh, public transport system in Gipuzkoa is a model in Spain and Europe together with London. It's uh, very similar because of this uh, price integration system. The same uh, tariffs or the same prices, and you'll soon uh, be able to see the discount uh, system and the collectives that benefit most from this. Uh, the same uh, tariffs are applied with uh, progressive uh, discounts uh, for people uh, that use uh, public transport on a regular basis. And this uh, provides a mode of transport uh, that uh, is uh, less uh, contaminating and uh, provides a greater equality. We have a discount system uh, based on use, and this makes us uh, especially uh, proud in relation to uh, equality through a system that uh, is aimed at uh, special bonuses uh, for the elderly, for young people, for the unemployed, with those with uh, lower income. And uh, our transport uh, system is uh, therefore uh, linked uh, to uh, the level of income of people. And the discounts are, are applied uh, depending on the income. And this is uh, what we're trying to build in Gipuzkoa and what we call a sustainable mobility. A mobility that, apart from green and ecological, is also democratic. Uh, it covers uh, the whole territory with this integrated public transport uh, network uh, where we all participate, town councils, provincial council, Basque government, and Spanish government through Renfe, the railway company. And as I said, by road and railway, at the service and for the benefit of everyone in Gipuzkoa, wherever uh, they live. What is the result uh, of all this? What is the uh, result of this uh, project uh, for democratic mobility? A constant growth uh, and uh, complete uh, loyalty uh, among um, Gipuzkoa citizens. And this uh, has been shown during even the worst times of the pandemic. Uh, and this can be seen in uh, the uh, score that Gipuzkoa uh, citizens give to the transport system. And uh, after the decision of the administrations of uh, reinforcing the creation of a single public transport system that is uh, coordinated and as well as uh, providing um, the guarantees of the price system, which is focused on those users uh, that uh, use public transport uh, more regularly. So the aim is uh, to uh, strengthen um, the social aspect. And before closing, an example related uh, to the inclusion of uh, the Renfe shuttle system with the Mugi system. It started in 2013, but the participation of Renfe began in 2019. And we can see how uh, the uh, loyalty of uh, Mugi has grown uh, over and above uh, the Renfe shuttle service. Um, as we can see on the chart, in 2018, the distribution of the various Renfe tickets uh, uh, around San Sebastian with the uh, monthly uh, card and uh, the uh, single tickets well, Renfe in April uh, 2019 made it possible to play with the Mugi card, and the result is what you can see uh, on the screen in blue that shows a, a growth of more than 50%. Blue is uh, the Mugi uh, card system. F more than 50% of the trips on uh, Renfe are paid with the Mugi card, which uh, shows uh, the universal use of the uh, tariff system which is obvious. The current uh, Mugi system, I would also like to mention the uh, number of people that are loyal to the system with almost 600,000 cards issued 
with a population in Gipuzkoa of 720,000 inhabitants. And uh, this means that 80% of the uh, users uh, are registered and therefore they have personalized uh, tariffs uh, depending on their profile, younger, older, or with uh, more or less income. And we can extend uh, the information uh, later on. But I would just like to emphasize uh, some of the uh, ideas I've shared. It's not that uh, we're uh, trying to show off uh, like uh, Bilbao, but we do feel that uh, Gipuzkoa is at the forefront of mobility, and we do uh, meet uh, the uh, strictest uh, European standards in relation to uh, sustainability in absolutely all dimensions to guarantee uh, these rights uh, through the public uh, transport system and as well as uh, guaranteeing uh, ecological green and sustainable development uh, the bas government in the eusko tren fleet and uh, we and with the hybrid uh, renovation of our fleet this guarantees an egalitarian uh, use of the transport system because without social uh, sustainability, as I said earlier, there won't be a democratic ecological transition. We're not perfect. Uh, we can always improve. But if our territory is in uh, the leading positions, it's because we've combined a non-discriminating transport system with a system that's uh, fair, a system uh, that uh, creates equality when before there was inequality. Not all of us have private vehicles or want to use it, and not all of us can afford uh, a public transport that is not equitable and social. Mobility in Gibutkwa combines technological innovation with uh, criterions of uh, equality, and therefore uh, this uh, leads to a just uh, and democratic public policy. We continue to improve, uh, and in this uh, spirit, uh, which has enabled us to uh, democratize public transport. Uh, and this can only be done um, by unity in uh, policies. Through the Mugi system, there has been uh, political uh, unity uh, between the government and the opposition with the same goal of continuing to contribute uh, to improving the uh, public system, regardless of ideology and also uh, regardless of uh, the uh, public administration you work for from the town councils to the Basque government uh, through the provincial council all the way through Renfe. And uh, we uh, haven't uh, yet connected to the French transport system. That's more complicated. But we are all able to uh, bring about uh, change and have an influence on our environment. Uh, and uh, when uh, public policies are coordinated, it makes it possible for those uh, changes to occur in the habits of citizens, in this case uh, in relation to mobility. We continue uh, to uh, work to improve our mobility and to make the mobility of uh, the Basque country, Spain and Europe uh, be based on criteria that are not just ecological and green, but also more social and more just. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, we're now going to uh, hand the floor over to Isaac Palencia, Director for Youth at the Department of Culture, Cooperating Youth and Sports at the Gipuzkoa Provincial Council. And uh, we're running very short of time. Good morning, everyone. I'm going to be brief in view of the time available. First of all, I would like to thank the organizers of the panel and especially uh, Jose Ignacio Asensio uh, for giving me the opportunity of speaking here, for uh, speaking uh, for the department uh, responsible for uh, youth uh, at the Gubithia Provincial Council. And uh, we uh, promote uh, the uh, activities of uh, children and youth uh, through empathy, proactivity, support, dynamization, education, and carry out direct interventions with boys and girls, teenagers and young people uh, to uh, provide collaboration and networking with other policies or other areas. Promotion as a sectorial policy uh, to intervene uh, directly with young people as uh, peoples that have uh, rights and specific uh, needs um, individually and uh, collectively 
to enable them uh, to uh, acquire them to uh, develop uh, towards emancipation. And to explain how uh, we work at the department, we uh, do this uh, through networking together with uh, city councils. For those of you uh, that uh, don't know about our network, we have uh, the inter-institutional network formed by the Ngiputhua Provincial Council and most of the town councils in Ngiputhua, 77, which represent 98% of the uh, population of Ngiputhua. It's a common space for debate, coordination, adoption of technical and political consensus, and it offers to its members advisory services related to the development of uh, the promotion of uh, youth and adolescents on a municipal uh, level and a provincial level. The participation in this network is carried out um, through the youth units uh, at uh, the town councils whose degree of specialization uh, varies in the territory and basically depends on the size of the population, the size of the municipality. And we work uh, directly on a municipal level with people whenever possible uh, through uh, specific services by uh, age brackets, uh, the, the uh, childhood services, uh, services uh, for uh, adolescents and uh, youth services. Um, although we have uh, fewer of these units, in 2019, through the approval of the Gastematica decree, we uh, established a, a model and a practice of public responsibility together with a social participation that considers the three uh, stages, uh, childhood, adolescence and youth. And uh, we uh, set up uh, the uh, youth uh, and uh, child promotion uh, services uh, in uh, Giputhwa and establish a direct intervention with uh, boys and girls, adolescents and youth uh, with intersectoral and interinstitutional coordination to try to obtain a mainstream influence. Um, to uh, promote the participation of young people to respond to their needs and aspirations, uh, such as enriching their education, facilitating access to employment and housing, or promoting their participation in the institutions made by, in the decision made by institutions. And uh, this is an introduction uh, to the promotion system. We have uh, a network where practically all city councils uh, work together on policies to uh, promote uh, children, adolescents, and uh, youth. During these years, we've been working systematically on the implementation of uh, these uh, facilities. And in my opinion, we're relatively satisfied uh, since in Gipuzkoa, we have developed uh, a, a network with 109 facilities with around 230 professionals, uh, educators. And uh, as I said, through these facilities, uh, the administrations in Gipuzkoa uh, work uh, with uh, these uh, children, adolescents, and young people in um, many areas. And one of the areas, as uh, we're uh, seeing in this uh, panel, is that of ecological transition. In recent years, uh, there have been a large number of programs developed, not just by the provincial council, but also by the town councils related to recycling, volunteer work, a fight against climate change, a large number of uh, programs uh, through uh, these services for children, adolescents, and youth. And um, the direct interventions must also be supplemented with a close cooperation with other sectors, areas, or policies that, in fact, have a major influence on improving the quality of life of uh, children, adolescents, and youth. So we carried out an, an indirect action to uh, lobby and try to influence, and especially collaborating with others uh, so that uh, they will work in the areas of responsibility in order to help these uh, young people. To carry out uh, this task of uh, influence and cooperation, we're establishing various alliances to develop projects with other areas, such as environment, but also with culture, transport, equality, participation, uh, Basque language. And uh, this is uh, uh, a job that we need to do more and recognize uh, the uh, intersectoral work, which is difficult but is basic to uh, defend the interests of young people. And this should be the way of uh, getting other areas to cooperate uh, that uh, often uh, still resist and do not uh, feel that uh, young people ought to be uh, treated differently but uh, should form part of mainstream policies. Um, 
that uh, they've carried out in the past. Uh, and I would obviously like to highlight our cooperation with the Department uh, for the Environment. As I said earlier, at the uh, Department for Youth, we try to cooperate with other departments and institutions so that the youth variable will be included in all policies carried out. And I have to say that in the case of uh, environmental policies, uh, they've made it really easy for us since it hasn't been need to apply pressure for them to consider young people since they have many programs and policies uh, such as the uh, subsidies uh, for uh, scientific research or uh, social volunteer work, among others. And in many cases, they have come to us to offer us uh, participation in their uh, programs for young people. And uh, I would like to thank them for that. In the uh, press conference uh, presenting think tanks uh, on young people for the climate said that uh, generational democracy is needed. The decisions we make now will uh, lead to future living conditions for young people. And that's why we have to work hand in hand with them to uh, build a green and sustainable uh, world. And I think that this phrase clearly summarizes uh, the goal of the policies that are being implemented by the DG for the Environment regarding youth participation. Hola. And according to what Europe has established for climate action that uh, generates um, programs for children that have set up an action framework, and by using the assistance of uh, young people to do something about the climate, the Department for Environmental Affairs wanted to incorporate the point of view of the youth in Gipuzkoa and uh, use this as a reference framework for the department itself. So the first uh, Basque Forum took place uh, where there were discussions on the environmental policies of the Provincial Council. The forum that forms part of the uh, Green Recovery Think Tank in the uh, Torquizuna X program wanted to create a space for reflection, to listen to the new generations or to the young generations uh, to, so that they could discover the department's uh, programs. And this forum that already has a one-year work program, there have been youngsters between 18 and 28 years of age, uh, all of them with different kinds of profiles. And at this uh, in gathering, there were representatives of the main associations dealing with uh, the environmental issues, workers from the provincial council, the students, uh, university students and vocational training students, covering different areas like company administration or communication. And Jóvenes por el Clima is the first forum of this kind in the Basque Country, and it was born in order to bring the climate uh, policy closer to one of the most uh, significant sectors. In Gibuthkwa, we have uh, nearly 100,000 young people, 15% of the total population of Gibuthkwa, and in recent surveys uh, show that 67% of these uh, young people that were surveyed said that the environmental protection and fight against climate change is one of the main political priorities or should be one of the main political priorities of the EU. And with the implementation of this forum, the Council now has taken on board the issues concerning youngsters in relation to critical issues like climate change and uh, environmental and economic and social consequences. This is going to have in our territory unless uh, the right measures are adopted. As I said before, this is a generic area, and we also want to improve well-being and uh, generate equal opportunity, equal opportunities. And uh, we also want to allow citizens to become actively involved in this uh, area. And we want uh, children and teenagers to become actively engaged too. We want to develop what we call the vegetable culture, the use of the Basque language, and even more so, we want to promote uh, sustainable behaviors and best practices. To conclude, I would like to underscore a couple of programs that we've implemented in these uh, recent years, and I think that they will allow us to further the involvement of young people and to promote um, programs against climate change. We have the empowerment program and another program for youngsters called Ausalan Trevo Bastea, is a training program for three kinds of users, uh, that is uh, young people, parents, and professionals. And this has only been in operation for several months for youngsters, and 12 uh, training sessions have already been held. And it's going to become a reference for young people, and it's also going to offer a tool so that our young people can be better trained and can be much more aware of what's going on. And in the case of the Al Salan program, which has been up and running for several years, it's uh, for youngsters between 18 and 30 years of age. 
and this has to do with the Sangor Sara grants uh, for youngsters. And the objective of these subsidies is to help develop ideas with a very clear social interest. And the people receiving this program are young people with an entrepreneurial spirit, creative people that want to set up their own project or a collective project in favor of society. But apart from the funding that is given to them, we also provide uh, consultancy and uh, training in each project. And I would like to underscore that although this project does not is not exclusively focused on climate change um, projects. A very high percentage of the proposals that I've received do have this approach, which says a lot about our young people in Kipuzkoa. Just to give you some examples, in recent years we've received uh, projects on agroecology, on new consumption habits, on community orchards, on small producers, on the restoration of furniture. And this shows uh, the potential of young people in Gipuzkoa, and even more so when we only focus on young people to criticize them. There are thousands of young people in our territory that want to make a contribution and want to do their best to achieve a much better society. To finish, I would like to say that the actions to be carried out to solve this uh, issue should not only have to focus on the present, but also on the future. We can not only focus on what is decided uh, at the major international summits. Climate change is a global issue that concerns the entire world. And we have to bear in mind that those issues that are being worked on at a local level and local decisions are fundamental too. Any human activities uh, nowadays or in the future will be sustainable, or if they're not, they won't exist. We know that this is the case. And Gibuthkwa is now addressing the climate uh, challenge as a necessity, but also as an opportunity. And as I said before, this has to be, we have to go all the way together with our young people in Gibuthkwa. This is our challenge. That's it for me. Thank you very much. Yeah. And I would now like to give the floor to Monica Pereira, who is the Director for Environmental Affairs. Well, as you've seen, we've explained the context. You've also seen what the challenges are like and the actions that have been taken and the strategies. But if we're dealing with a systemic change, we have to speed up all of our policies. But what we cannot do is um, lose in terms of efficacy or action. So another of the objectives we've set at uh, our department is to measure on a yearly basis each and every one of the policies and the actions that have already been carried out. Because at the end of the day, there can be no policies without any money, and this money has to be properly invested. So what we did in 2018 was to draw up the 2050 strategy for Gipuzkoa, a strategy with nine goals, which uh, applies to all of the departments at the uh, Provincial Council, and where year after year we analyze what improvements we've made and the degree of efficacy that has been achieved by the money we've invested in uh, this kind of work. And what we have to do is use more renewables. We have to reduce greenhouse gases. In other words, all the issues we saw before. So we look into issues like energy, mobility, territorial resilience, uh, resilience of the primary sector, and circular economy, anticipating risks, innovation, and uh, the role, and this is where we criticize ourselves, the role that we have to play as a public authority. And apart from analyzing how we are implementing these policies and how things change year on year and how we achieve these goals that we set in the object in the strategy, we also have to see what kind of progress is being made by the territory itself, not only the provincial council, but also the town councils in terms of sustainability. And this is why at our department we've analyzed 15 of the 17 goals. 15 where we have a direct or an impact, direct or indirect impact, and we do so by analyzing 62 indicators, 45 that had to do with context defined by the United Nations and 17 that have to do with performance indicators as defined by our department. And finally, there's a third tool which is the tool that evaluates our public policies. And uh, this is called the Foundation of Climate Change, Natur Klima. It was born in 2018, supported by the 2050 Gipuzkoa strategy, and it has a priority mission. And that is to analyze uh, the evolution of uh, climate change in Gipuzkoa and uh, for implementing circular economy programs and energy transition programs. And 
what we first did is analyze things. We measured, analyzed, and monitored more than 200 variables. And this allows us to see year on year how things change or what kind of impacts we've had and what kind of patterns are modified in Gibraltar from the point of view of climate change. And we also establish forecasts for different scenarios and for different years, too. And also through Nadur Klima, we've been working intensely through hubs on circuit economy and energy transition. A hub is a space where what we are trying to do is achieve or establish a meeting point. As I said before, we want uh, companies to cooperate with each other so that they can evaluate uh, the progress that has been made in terms of circular economy. And what does the snapshot, what does it look like nowadays in our most recent analysis? If we bear in mind how things are going in Gibraltar, as regards uh, greenhouse uh, gas emissions, we can say that our territory in 2019 has reached uh, a reduction of 9.7 percent of these gases compared to 2018. But if we compare this figure with the year 2005, we have a reduction of 30.7 percent of our greenhouse uh, gases. So what this means is that at this point in time, we are nine point, there's a difference of 9.3 points relative to the goal that we set in the Gibraltar strategy for 2050, which was a reduction of 60 percent. So if we were to look into those sectors that have contributed most towards these greenhouse gases to continue working on this self-assessment policy, we can see that it's uh, transportation with 46.8 percent, industry with 19.5 percent, and the energy sector with 17.9 percent. And this is why the future projects that are going to be presented by the deputy are focused on working in these sectors that produce uh, the highest levels of greenhouse gases. And as I said before, we have a strategy in Gibuzkoa, which is called Gibuzkoa Clima 2050, that uh, contemplates 99 actions that have to be carried out. In the year 2019, the Provincial Council of Gibuzkoa uh, spent uh, 30.5 million euros and in the fight against climate change. We have implemented 72 out of the 99 actions that we'd uh, established. And at this execution rate, and considering how much collaboration is being received, as you can see here from all of the departments and the Provincial Council, because this is a transversal uh, approach, we expect to reach a level of compliance of 54 percent by next year, which is when we will revise the strategy itself so we will not only evaluate the degree of compliance, but we will also incorporate the most recent modifications in terms of regulations and commitments that have to do with the Glasgow Summit and other international accords. I'm not going to dwell on this, but as you can see, we analyze the different uh, goals. We do so on a year-on-year -year basis. You can see that in energy, we've managed to go from 21 to 29. Mobility, as uh, my colleague said, this is one of the um, goals that has advanced most with only seven points only in the year 2019. And this is how we analyze all of our policies. And then finally, and as I said before, and thanks to the Nadur Klima Foundation and thanks to the observatory we have there, we analyze more than 200 variables, 200 uh, climate variables. 200 um, natural environment variables. And what we do is instead of focusing on the global issues, we focus on the local issues to see how climate change is going to affect us in Gibuthkwa. This is a very vulnerable territory, and we are on the coast. And as you know, 40 odd percent of our people live along the coast, where we can see how important uh, climate change is uh, along our coastline. And as regards our territorial um, measures, and the consequences for our rivers and for our supply services, and so on and so forth. So this is why, on a yearly basis, Gibuthkwan, thanks to this foundation, we submit a reference report at a territorial level where we do not only see how much the natural system is evolving, but we also consider what kind of impact this is having on our socio-economic elements. Because when we say that we have 40 percent of our people living along the coastline and that we're losing two-thirds of the sand we have there, we're talking about the impact that this can have in terms of the tourist business, for instance, in Gibuthkwa. And I've presented this as an example. But as I've been told that we are running out of time, I'm going to stop here. And now I am going to give the floor to um, my colleague so that he can talk about the future proposals and future projects we want to address. Jose Ignacio, please, you have the floor.
Thank you very much, uh, Monica, Isaac, and everybody else. I'm going to be extremely brief because I think that after that we're going to have the Q&A session and that's the most interesting part. And uh, we've stuck to our promise. We wanted to make this more dynamic, but I'm going to be very brief. As you can see, we had a plan. We've uh, explained the different programs we had. And we've also made an assessment. And right now, there are some projects for the future that I would like to stress, because I think that the five that I'm about to present to you are important. We've presented 10 European projects, but I would like to focus on five and, uh, well, on the first three, basically, because uh, of a lack of time, energy transition. We carried out and we made an investment in waste management infrastructures and when you treat uh, in organic uh, waste, well, we did two things. Composting up to a certain level, and what couldn't be covered is uh, biomethanized. And it's true, and we have to recognize that this was not the target. It wasn't uh, what we were supposed to do, because biomethanization, it becomes electricity, and it was electricity for dwellings. But we have an opportunity here because as we have the facilities and the infrastructures, we could also produce green hydrogen. And how much? Well, we're going to be having a pilot project. It's a pilot project of 500 kilos per day with the possibility of reaching 2,000 in the collaboration with the, the Department of Mobility because with 2,000 kilos per day, we could uh, supply the entire um, system, uh, transport system with hydrogen. But anyway, I won't say any more. If you have any questions, we will discuss this. And the other issue, as Monica pointed out, has to do with the circular economy projects. And uh, I would like to underscore three. We have the innovation pole for plastic. And with plastic, we have a serious problem because, uh, firstly, because it uh, contains uh, fossil fuels, and secondly, because when you eliminate them, this uh, produces a very big problem. However, uh, replacing plastic also represents a very big problem as regards the carbon footprint. And three or four, I don't know where I stand, we have a very powerful industry in the territory that is very international and very competitive. But this innovation center for plastic is uh, focused on replacing um, oil as a raw material, as a primary raw material. Those of you that are familiar with this, it does. It focuses on chemical um, recycling that uh, does a, a selective collection of plastic. Uh, this we can describe this later on. But we are very excited. It involves more than 80 millions, and it's a PPP, and uh, we want. Uh, all of the administrations to become involved. And I didn't show the slide, by the way. But anyway, but the next issue has to do with uh, the reutilization, because we focus a lot on recycling. But uh, the only major infrastructure we have for optimum management to be implemented or to have a complete management of waste would uh, have to be based on having more capacity to reutilize materials. And for that, you need a place where these materials can be prepared. We're talking about textiles, we're talking about furniture, and we're talking about large objects, etc., etc. We're talking about the household appliances, and we're talking about reutilization, about repairs, and we're talking about uh, increasing uh, the level of uh, management for domestic waste, too. And I'm not going to dwell on this, but in any case, it's a project that's going to be launched uh, very soon. And by the end of 2022, we want to have the infrastructure. If not uh, up and running, it will be nearly there. And then and there's another project that is equally interesting that we're doing in the technology centers. And it's uh, Horizon. Uh, project, but it's the ASIMOV or ASIMOB project. We want to recover critical materials, especially those that are related to electric motors, and we want to reutilize uh, batteries from vehicles. This has advanced quite a lot. We have uh, the technological experts. We have scientific capabilities, too. And it's going to be one of the projects that we will be boosting. And finally, and I'm going to finish here. This uh, natural klima was also mentioned before. Natural klima is going to play an outstanding role as regards achieving climate neutrality. And here we're talking about uh, many, many decisions. In other words, compensating the carbon footprint that many uh, companies are asking for. 
And uh, let's do this in the territory. This is why we have an instrument uh, like Naturklima or environmental fiscality or the uh, network of uh, green infrastructures. And I'm not going to say any more about this. And if you have any questions, we can uh, talk about this. But we believe that these uh, five projects uh, were important and had to be mentioned here because we I'd like to say that we did the planning and that we did the regulations. And we started to work on this, and now, obviously, we are now at your entire disposal to be evaluated. And, of course, we are more than willing to receive uh, any critiques on any, and we'd, we'd like to make improvements too. And many thanks to the team, because your engagement, not only of you guys sitting in the first row, but also those guys in the second row and other people too. Thank you very much indeed for your work. And what is it supposed to be happening now? Okay, well, you're here to manage the situation then. Okay, well, let's move on directly to the questions, please. Monica Rafi, uh, please take a seat. Okay, we've got very little time left, only 10 minutes or so, so it's now your turn, the audience. So the presentations have uh, been delivered. I'm not sure if anybody has anything to say from the committee. There are two mics available, floor mics. Well, okay, as there are no questions, I will um, ask you the first question. Climate change is a global uh, challenge, and uh, can we address this from Gibuthkwa? Can it be addressed from a local perspective? Please use the microphone. Thank you. Shall I kick off? Well, yes, I believe that this has to do with a multi-level management issue. and. Uh, in the, my opening speech, I made a very quick comment and uh, what I said that uh, whatever concerns uh, climate summits, uh, the major objectives can be addressed uh, at summits, but uh, where do we decide how, what we can do, what we should do, or how we consume? How can we articulate our economic activities? How can we boost our industries in which uh, sectors do we have to invest? This is something that we do either locally or territorially. So in this regard, I think that the, the public administrations, not only the provincial council, but we town councils have a lot to say. And obviously, everything has to agree. And it's not either global or local. It's both things. So in other words, and this has to be a continuous approach, and everybody has to play their role. And then we are um, very complex public uh, structures where competencies have a follow a continuum. And sometimes we need to have a collaboration between different administrations. And then the things that are not covered by the administrations, and I'm referring to our citizens because there are certain economic sectors that are obviously um, supporting this uh, transformation of our society. I therefore believe that it's a complex issue, but at the same time, I think that the local authorities have many, many things to say because we've spoken about transport, and I think that it was explained perfectly well by Rafa or by the, uh, my colleague and what this means. The, the system to, that we have to implement to do away with cars and to put our stakes on public transport, and I suppose that this is a major decision if you either drive your car every day or if you use public transport. But I would like to say that 40% of the CO2 emissions in the territory of Gibuthkwa has to do with transport. Juggling mic etiquette. Uh, hello, uh, Kirsten Dunlop, um, CEO of Climate Kick. May I ask two questions? Uh, having been at COP in Glasgow, and I heard you refer to adjusting the policies of the region based on the outcomes of the Glasgow summit. Um, there was a lot of focus on the importance of regions, of subnational actors, of regions and cities acting now 
systemically and with urgency. So very much speaks to the question of why, how does a region solve a global problem? But there is increasingly a recognition that 2050 is too late. So my question is, what would it take for Gipuzkoa to up the level of ambition to climate neutrality by 2030 in line with the European missions and the Green Deal objectives on much more transformative change? And what would it take to enlarge the scope of the ecological transition in Gipuzkoa to a focus on changing the relationship with the environment in terms of demand rather uh, in addition to substitution of energy and uh, recycling and waste and the kind of the imp improvements and efficiencies with existing emissions, but to really change the relationship, the underpinning regenerative relationship with the environment. Well, as far as I understood, uh, the sound is very poor. What is it we have to do in Gipuzkoa to um, skip one of those steps to achieve uh, the things that were mentioned in Glasgow? That was one of the questions, wasn't it, if I'm not mistaken? Well, shall I try? Can you hear me now? Si. Okay. No, the question, there were two questions, but maybe I just start with one. Um, the question has to do with the question of 2050 versus 2030. Climate neutrality by 2050 is too late. And increasingly in Glasgow, it was very evident and very aware that there is a disconnect between the international national process and a recognition at sub-national action at level, at regional level, and city level, that the transformation will need to come faster if we are to survive and stay safe. My question is, how could Gipuzkoa raise the level of ambition to becoming closer to the European missions on climate neutrality by 2030 for the region? And how could that, uh, an approach to changing the demand for high carbon emission lifestyles uh, enable that? to a regenerative relationship with assets and resources in Gipuzkoa. En 2050 es ya, es, estamos ya tarde. ¿Qué, qué, ¿Qué tenemos que hacer para, para acelerar, para mejorar, para activar más eh, es de esas políticas que se vayan a desarrollar? ¿Qué tenemos que hacer para que Guipúzcoa esté suba de escalón y vaya mejorando esas políticas? Y luego, por otra parte, esto también, ¿qué, qué, qué cambios va a generar en, en las conductas, en, en la gente, en la sociedad? Bueno, efectivamente. Well, yes, as you pointed out, what we usually say is that 2050 and the target set for 2050 sounds like it's very far away. But what we have to work on, and this is what Gibuthko is doing, is that these 2050 targets, well, we're looking more at 2030, but with another target which has to do with 2025. We want to be even more ambitious because we're clear that you cannot reach this target of 2050 if we don't reach the target of 2030 five years earlier. So that's why we're working on all of these policies in a much quicker manner. But what should Gipuzkoa do? We've already explained this. So this is why we've launched the decarbonization program for our economy. So in other words, we're already taking steps with our citizens. We're already working in the area of circular economy. But what we have to do is speed up these three sectors that produce more greenhouse gases. Uh, one of them is transport, and this is why we are uh, clearly focused on green hydrogen in our territory. Industries, and this is why we are clearly focusing on decarbonizing our economy, and then we have energy. It is true, and uh, we cannot uh, fool ourselves, but it's true that Gipuzkoa is uh, the place where, although we have a roadmap to implement a sustainability strategy for energy, where we're going to be promoting things through the energy cooperatives and communities, with that, Gipuzkoa is not going to be able to achieve 80% of renewables. So this is why it's absolutely fundamental to work in the field of energy efficiency in our industries and in our administrations and also at homes. And this has to be supported by another clear-cut issue, 
and as we didn't have enough time, we didn't explain this, but this is the change of behaviors. And uh, we also have to involve our citizens in this disruptive uh, change we are currently dealing with. We didn't want to discuss uh, this uh, project in depth, but we do have a project that is currently underway that is called uh, Citizens Committed to the Climate. And this is a program we've launched in this year, in 2021, that we're going to be piloting for a year with the rest of the citizens of Gibuthkwa that do want to participate. And we have something like 400 people enrolled in this uh, stage one. And what we want them is to support us to implement this change so that we can do so through a um, tendering process. What we're doing is working with them with uh, different challenges, and they can give us recommendations in terms of mobility, food, um, shopping, and all these issues we've covered over the years. And I was uh, telling in the presentation, what I was saying is that we need to have a disruptive change. We need to have a new growth strategy, but we're not going to do each uh, one individually. We either collaborate and uh, we will then work as a true ecosystem with the companies, with citizens and with the industries. And if we don't do it that way, we'll not achieve anything by 2050 or 2030 for that matter. Yes, it's obvious, uh, as uh, mentioned in the question, that uh, we're already uh, running late uh, here and beyond Gibuthwa. But uh, I find myself in such a complex uh, country, uh, the Basque country, but we need to align policies and goals. And I think that they've only just started to align but uh, we've taken quite a long time in aligning uh, the goals in the fight against climate change. Uh, and by this, I mean with the state authorities, uh, the regional authorities, the territorial authorities. And uh, this has uh, run somewhat late. And in the field of transport, it's uh, true that uh, in Gipuzkoa and uh, elsewhere, uh, it uh, does pollute. But when we talk about transport, we have public transport, private transport, uh, the uh, transport of travelers and the transport of freight. So the uh, first uh, race we have to win is uh, the race uh, from uh, private cars to public transport. And I tried to make myself understood, but what I was trying to explain is uh, that we're uh, integrating all the public transport uh, actors uh, to be able to cover the entire territory. Because if we don't cover the entire territory with uh, a tariff policy uh, for everyone, the option will always be the private vehicle. And uh, there's a risk of uh, people uh, being left outside uh, that ecological uh, transition because they won't be able to afford private transport. So I think it's uh, basic for uh, transport policies uh, to consider that as well as improving the quality standards in the tariffs or prices uh, and uh, benefiting those that use public transport uh, the most, uh, as uh, well as uh, working on energy for public transport, there need to be uh, cross-sectional policies uh, to prioritize uh, public transport versus the use of private transport. Uh, and uh, freight uh, transport uh, is also related to uh, railway uh, transport. Um, that's an area for the Basque uh, governments. It's somewhat outside my field. But if there's, uh, if there's not uh, enough support uh, for uh, public transport, uh, we're uh, not uh, going to uh, improve uh, the figures. But we do hope to improve the figures uh, on time. Thank you. Well, my name is Joaquin Nieto, and I'm one of the experts uh, that uh, will have uh, to uh, make a critique tomorrow morning. A question about transport, and I thought that the public transport uh, program was very interesting. But I wonder if there's a specific uh, transport uh, program to the workplace. Because in some cases, the Barcelona Provincial Council, for example, has worked on this. And uh, they've uh, focused uh, specifically on uh, routes uh, to workplaces, especially uh, when there are advanced uh, public transport policies. Uh, a lot could be done in this area. 
Well, I had several questions, but I also had another question on uh, citizens' participation on an organized basis. In other words, we've heard about resorting to citizens, involving citizens, and it's very important uh, to involve citizens individually, also uh, to involve uh, young people. But uh, part of the participation is the participation of uh, organized society. Uh, green organizations, citizens' organizations, trade union organizations. In other words, how to uh, share all this program with the uh, organized uh, areas of society. Is there anything along those lines? And uh, yesterday, the first uh, uh, session of uh, the Citizens' Assembly was held in Spain, established as a result of uh, the Climate Change Act. But uh, there's also an aim to uh, do this uh, on a regional level, a local level, a provincial level. Have you looked into the possibility of setting up a citizens' assembly? Perhaps uh, choosing citizens through a draw of some kind for them to make uh, proposals in relation to this uh, ambitious plan you have at this provincial council for which I would like to congratulate you. Well, I'll start uh, with uh, transport. Uh, the concept is different. It, uh, it's for everywhere. And that's why the uh, possibility of uh, getting all the uh, public transport operators uh, to work together, optimizing their coverage so that uh, it will reach every place. And uh, public transport, uh, more than uh, being uh, aimed at using public transport to go to work, and the vast majority of us do that. But uh, the uh, goal in the end is to favor the use of uh, public transport in general. What we are doing in the area of uh, mobility is uh, focused on uh, expanding uh, public transport, uh, industrial uh, estates, uh, for example. But uh, the uh, system as it's designed in Gipuzkoa is not uh, just uh, a system that's used to go to work. It's for leisure. It's for care. If uh, there isn't uh, efficient uh, public care, this uh, creates much uh, greater inequality for women, who uh, basically uh, are the people that provide the care. So practically all over uh, Gipuzkoa, I'm sure that uh, it will be possible to improve, but we can get to practically everywhere in the province using public transport. Yes, citizens' participation, uh, several aspects. Uh, the uh, strategy in the fight against climate change, Gipuzkoa, uh, Klima, was uh, developed uh, with uh, practically equivalent participation uh, as if it had been uh, uh, a provincial uh, act uh, with the participation of all the stakeholders, the various collectives, the various groups, uh, and where all the uh, contributions were included or uh, responded to. And uh, I know that this is reformal. That's not what you're asking about. But the same thing happened with the peak group local regulations, and it's also happening with the energy sustainability strategy, which although they are not provincial regulations uh, as such, there is also uh, uh, participation on that level. Two years ago, we set up two think tanks. One is Citizens for Climate and another one, Young People for the Climate, mentioned earlier, where there's a bit of everything. It's true that there are ecologist groups, uh, stakeholders, universities. And uh, there's a significant participation of town councils, uh, as well as various other collectives. And in the think tank, Young People for the Climate, uh, we're doing something similar. Uh, we uh, have various uh, groups and collectives that are working intensely in the uh, field. And they are part of the organized uh, society, which I think you were asking about. 
Is that the end of it? No. Uh, in the think tanks, one of our aims, although this will be a joint decision, but one of our aims is uh, to set up uh, this kind of uh, uh, more standing advisory body. In the Basque Country, these bodies already exist. The environmental advisory committees where all the administrations participate, but there's also participation from all the collectives, the trade unions, uh, the uh, ecology groups. I don't remember the figure, but uh, there are between 30 to 40 collectives uh, involved and uh, where the uh, advisory uh, bodies uh, have been uh, working along these lines uh, for years. It's nothing new. It's always possible to uh, intensify, but uh, during uh, this period, there has been a much greater citizen's participation. It's uh, nothing like uh, what it was like 10 years ago. It won't be enough. It won't be enough. But uh, since uh, there are bodies such as these committees that, that are called Gama and Coma in the Basque uh, country, but uh, there are also more informal aspects and probably more dynamic uh, ways of doing it, such as uh, the uh, think tanks. Uh, and we can see them here. And uh, we uh, complete this with the think tank on circular economy and uh, green taxes that we uh, do together with the tax department. But the other two are pure citizens' uh, participation. Yes, uh, you were referring uh, to uh, formal participation processes. And uh, yes, we do this in the uh, two uh, provincial decrees, the Energy Sustainability uh, Decree and uh, the Fight Against Climate Change and the Plan for the Circular Economy. We have uh, developed uh, processes for participative deliberation in some cases with uh, the organized society. And some processes have lasted six months, others a year, depending on the group of agents involved. And uh, obviously, all the uh, policies uh, we face uh, cannot uh, be carried out with this uh, participation process. And it's done through uh, information meetings, uh, through uh, comparison meetings, deliberation meetings, where uh, we uh, check it out with organized society, town councils, uh, public administrations, businesses, uh, ecological organizations, all of them. All the regulations uh, uh, have uh, a deliberative uh, participation process uh, always. Well, I'm Jesus Martinez Linares uh, from the Sostende Foundation. I would first uh, like to thank you for your wonderful initiative and especially your Basque hospitality. On behalf of the uh, advisors, we're all delighted. And my question was related to climate neutrality. And uh, the saying goes uh, that uh, you should practice what you preach. And uh, uh, in relation to good, good practices, uh, the Andalusian government, for example, in its Department of Farming, Fishing, uh, Cattle Farming and Environment has calculated its own uh, corporate uh, carbon footprint. And then uh, there's a communication plan, a registration plan. But uh, you at the DG for the Environment here at the Provincial Council, have you considered uh, developing uh, this kind of project? Well, it was explained by Jose Ignacio a bit at the end. The uh, project we want to promote, or one of the projects for the future, is a voluntary uh, CO2 fund, is a fund that goes much further for uh, companies to be able to calculate their footprint. And we, as an institution, well, the year the department uh, years ago calculated its uh, footprint. But it's true that we want to start with a voluntary CO2 fund uh, in order to uh, calculate uh, the footprint of the institution, first of all. Because when we say that one of our targets uh, is to be an exemplary administration, well, we can't do that if we uh, don't begin there. And the aim of this uh, fund is not just to calculate the footprint, but uh, for us uh, to be able to calculate ours and for uh, industries to be able to calculate theirs on a voluntary basis. And this comes from uh, the industry itself. Although they uh, don't have an obligation to do it, uh, if uh, they do it on a, voluntarily, on a voluntary basis, we can uh, make use of that synergy. So those uh, funds uh, 
will be aimed at the policy of biodiversity. And this green infrastructure plan we presented will be able to be carried out thanks to that CO2 fund because you mentioned it. When we talk about climate neutrality, it's a matter of what we emit minus what we absorb. And uh, if uh, there's something that plays that role, that's a green infrastructure. Well, thank you very much uh, for the very uh, thorough presentation. One of the things I would have liked you to talk about are the difficulties uh, you found uh, in getting to where you are. And I'm thinking, for example, of the famous case of the incineration plant. In the end, there's uh, an incineration plant, uh, there's a gas producing plant, etc. But I think it would be interesting for you to explain this because uh, this is uh, a lesson for other regions, countries, etc., that are going through the same transition. Thank you. Well, as you said, uh, Jesus, uh, I think that the uh, video started by explaining that. In 2015, we had a waste problem. We uh, had nowhere to take the waste. Uh, and when I say that, I mean, we didn't even have infrastructures. Uh, we didn't have them in Gipuzkoa. And uh, we found that we had to export the waste uh, to uh, neighboring regions uh, where they helped us and where there was solidarity. It's uh, true that this uh, meant uh, a problem because we didn't have a program as such to fight against climate change. We didn't have a circular economy program. And in the end, uh, this meant that we had to look for a global solution. And uh, we had to uh, solve uh, the short-term uh, problems and uh, provide an answer to short-term problems. But this meant uh, that uh, we needed to uh, start to, to uh, think about the fact that uh, not having a waste management program led us uh, to the circular economy. This led us to develop a plan to fight uh, against uh, climate change. And this led to the energy program. So there have been many difficulties. The first uh, was the waste problem, because it was much more than a waste problem. We were talking about uh, leaving waste on the street. And there we were talking about a health problem. So I think that uh, over the years, the hallmark has been planning and management, and one thing has led to the next. And now we believe that uh, we have uh, uh, much more orderly planning that uh, can respond to the challenges we're currently facing with the coronavirus and with the Green Deal. It's uh, uh, true that we had already reflected on that. And what are we doing now? We're speeding up those projects, projects that we'd already planned to uh, carry out. We're going to speed them up and make use of this uh, current opportunity that has been put on the table by the government of Spain. The uh, recovery and resilience plan is uh, the big opportunity that all territories have to uh, make these uh, strategic programs grow. Well, thank you all very much. I would just like to remind you that the conference starts again at uh, 9 o'clock. It's been a pleasure, so I look forward to seeing you again. Thank you.